Um, so yeah, I gave the the title Mirror Symmetry for pan surfaces. Surfaces. I'm conscious that pan surface Surface is perhaps not a very standard piece of terminology, but what I mean by it is certain non-compact hyperkähler manifolds of quaternionic dimension one. In other words, certain log Calabi-Yau surfaces which um, can be derived from uh, the pan equations. So that's some very now classical um, object uh, in the theory of differential equations, which was discovered in the 20th century. So <clears throat> I wish to um, uh, introduce these uh, log Calabia surfaces from the perspective of the pan equations. And then in the second half of the talk, I will try to say something about mirror symmetry for these log Calabia surfaces and how aspects of that relate to uh, the pan equations themselves. So I said just before the talk that I'm a novice with virtual seminars. I'm also a novice with Beamer presentations. So um, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions if things become unclear. I'm also conscious from seeing the participants that I have a very diverse audience. So um, I apologize if I uh, have kept um, the uh, story at a sort of non-technical level in various points, because I want to try and tell a story that can be followed by uh, everyone who's listening. OK, so with that, um, here is uh, what is a pretty become the pretty typical picture of uh, how to depict pan equations. So, so what are they? They are certain second order differential equations. They're rational, so they're of the form, the second derivative of say Q, so Q prime prime is a rational function in Q, Q prime and T. Uh, and um, they have this special property that the only movable singularities of their solutions are poles. So if you take some arbitrary second order differential equation, you can find solutions with, say, essential singularities that move as you move in time. Um, but these pan equations have this very special property that um, they're solutions only have poles as movable singularities. That's now called the pan property. So they're all named after Paul pan who was a French mathematician of the early 20th century, even went on to be French prime minister. Uh, the typical notation for them is uh, to have a Roman numeral. So he himself identified six. Um, so these are Panlevé 1, Panlevé 2, Panlevé 3, Panlevé 4, Panlevé 5, Panlevé 6. I hope you can all at least see my cursor, which I will use as a pointer. Um, so these are uh, the six equations he identified. Of course, there are many, many second order differential equations whose only movable singularities and poles, but these are somehow interesting in the sense in the sense that they um, their solutions are not expressible in terms of previously known special functions so you can't express them in terms of things like abelian integrals or something like that so these were the, the six he identified so for various reasons over time uh, this diagram now has 10 things in it so that's to do with the fact that, for one thing, there are um, two different realizations of uh, two of these equations. So I've expressed those with these sort of vertical, equal-looking signs. 
we'll see a bit of that later in the talk. And then it's also become useful to distinguish certain degenerate cases of this panel of A3 equation. So that's this little thing in brackets over here. Uh, so one more thing that uh, I would like to say here is that um, really these equations come in families. So there's a sort of four parameter family of panel of A6. Uh, and uh, this is in some sense the mother of all the rest of them, <clears throat> in the sense that there is a sort of limiting procedure through which the remaining panel of A equations can be uh, gotten from uh, panel of A6. So I will spend a lot of time talking about panel of A6 because somehow everything that you can this is the most complicated example and probably everything we can do here, we'll be able to do further down the chain. Um, so these, uh, these numbers, this parameter space will also express the fact that you have, uh, actually, I said I will associate log Calabria surfaces to the panel of A equations. I will associate families of log Calabria surfaces and uh, these numbers indicate the, uh, the dimension of the base of the family. So I should probably try to be rather explicit with the parameters, but at least for the first part of the talk, I've left them often rather implicit in the presentation. And hopefully towards the end again, we will see something to do with these parameters. Okay, so that's a, a brief history of these panel of A equations. Um, so there are actually two approaches or sort of two main approaches to the study of the panel of A equations since their discovery back then. So I think one line sort of goes through this Hamiltonian description of the panel of A equations, which was much studied by Okamoto in the 80s. Um, so here we should think about having <clears throat> the complex plane with its standard holomorphic symplectic form and coordinates Q and P, so position and momentum. And then uh, I've taken panel of A1 here as an example because it's by far the easiest one to write down. Um, so the panel of A1 equation you can see here. Um, this is a very simple even polynomial equation in Q and T. Um, and it has a Hamiltonian description in the sense that you have this time dependent function of P and Q um, such that this equation is equivalent to this sort of standard Hamiltonian formula. Q prime is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to P and Q prime is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to Q. Um, so, so the only sort of um, odd thing, if you remember, Hamiltonian formulations of classical dynamics is this time dependence. So, um, so this Hamiltonian is non-autonomous, as people say. Um, and there is a similar Hamiltonian description for the remaining Pandave cases. You can even do something quite clever, which is in this remark here, to if you transform the time variable, so if you look at some trigonometric function of the time variable or maybe elliptic function of the time variable for panda v6, you can write, uh, you can bring all of um, uh, the panda v equations into this sort of form where the Hamiltonian looks like uh, a particle moving in a potential. So this is the sort of kinetic energy term and this is the potential. And of course, the time dependence of the Hamiltonian 
is, is still there and you can give them input. Okay, so so far I just said um, something about uh, C2, but really the solutions themselves have, <clears throat> solutions of the Panlevé equations have these movable poles. So, so if I want to um, uh, be able to follow this Hamiltonian flow when it goes into the poles, I really need to, to compactify this, this space. So that's the subject of the following slide. Um, so this is really uh, the work of Okamoto. So you realize that the, the, the nice compactification, which he called a space of initial conditions for the Panlevé equations, can be realized by um, so blowing up the projected plane in nine infinitely near points and then removing an anti-canonical divisor from the plane. So, so before we had this C2, you can go off to infinity, but so there you need to do some blow ups to resolve the dynamics. Um, fortunately, the blow ups really do involve infinitely near points, so they're kind of rather complicated to write down. Um, and that's what happens. Um, you can extend the, the holomorphic symplectic form from C2 to have poles on this anti-canonical divisor that you remove, but they have multiplicities. Uh, and the multiplicities are given by um, the sort of standard multiplicities that you have on these uh, thinking diagrams. So this diagram that I've written down here shows the um, the type of the anti-canonical uh, divisor which has to be removed. So these are all uh, affine thinking of type D or type E. Um, and there is also uh, a converse here, so you can go you can go the other way, as it were. So um, if you were just studying um, surfaces which are obtained as blow ups of the plane in nine points. These are commonly called Halfen surfaces. Um, and pairs of those in an anti canonical divisor, you can find that um, these ones are ones where there is uh, a locally trivial deformation of the pair of Halfen surface and the anti canonical divisor. Uh, and if you unravel what that means, you can uh, recover um, the Panlevé equation from this locally trivial deformation of the pair of surface and anti-canonical divisor. So if history had been the other way around, you could derive the Panlevé equations from, from the geometry. Okay, so uh, I want to say quickly that um, there is a, a limiting process that we can undergo. So I said the, the Panlevé equations have this Hamiltonian form with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Of course, um, one thing we could do is to try and uh, find a limit in which that Hamiltonian becomes non-time-dependent, becomes autonomous. So you can do that, you can introduce a scaling parameter which multiplies the instances of T in the potential. And then in the limit, you recover a sort of picture of classical Hamiltonian dynamics. So uh, in the limit, these, uh, the flow, the Hamiltonian flow starts to go round and round a torus. So, take Panlevé 1, which is the example we had a couple of slides ago. Um, so if you remember the Hamiltonian was, um, you can sort of see it in here, so we had uh, p squared or minus p squared plus q cubed plus t q. So if I take some limits over that t becomes a constant, I've labeled it here by c. 
um, then uh, what you see is is this. So um, the in the limit you you see this uh, family of tori, these elliptic curves, um, parameterized by the value of the Hamiltonian, um, and the uh, the flow um, limits to a flow along the tori. So, so in the case of panel A1, you just see these sort of elliptic curves in via stress form, and the the solution of this limit of panel of A1 is is a via stress p function. So function in the tori. Okay, so from this geometric perspective, we also have, um, we said that these uh, spaces of initial conditions for the panel of A equations come by blowing up the projective plane in nine points. Um, so if you do that in a general nine points, um, you don't see uh, um, these uh, cubic curves appearing. But of course, if if you imagine eight of them being fixed and you move the ninth point, then there's a place for that ninth point so that um, the nine points lie on a cubic curve and indeed a pencil of cubic curves. Um, and then uh, blowing up in those nine points gives you a rational elliptic surface with the last blow up defining a section. So you have this um limit of the panel of a equations this autonomous limit and what that corresponds to in this geometric picture is you um take a, a limit to a, a rational elliptic surface uh, again you have this anti-canonical divisor which you want to remove uh, it has exactly the same type as on the previous slide i will go back to the previous slide for a second so, and here you, you will probably recognize that these are all uh, possible uh, fibers of uh, rational elliptic surfaces. So, um, to use the, the Kodaira notation, we would have uh, I naught star, I one star, I two star, I three star, I four star, and then four star, three star, and two star. So. So what you actually end up removing is a fiber of the rational elliptic surface. Okay, so that's that's one perspective on how to get a, a non-compact hyperkähler manifold out of these Panlevé equations. Um, you can um, get uh, the complement of a, an anti-canonical divisor in the blow-up of nine points, or if you like this particular limit, you can get the complement of a, a fiber in a rational elliptic surface. Right, so I would now like to move on to the sort of other perspective. So I think the other dominant perspective in the study of the panel of A equations is through isomonodrom. Uh, this really goes back to to a contemporary of Panlevé, Richard Fuchs, with the sun. Uh, and um, so he found a connection between uh, Panlevé 6 and isomonodromic deformations of connections in a rank 2 bundle over the four punctured sphere. So if I think about the four punctured sphere, um, uh, it sort of has one complex modulus, namely the cross ratio of the of the four the four punctures. So we can normalize three of them to to live at zero, one, and infinity. So I will take a uh, View that cross ratio just as t. So I'll fix three of the punches and, and move one of them. Okay, so then <clears throat> um, already, uh, so this Panlevé 6 equation you can see is then equivalent to um, these Schlesinger equations. I don't know why this is 
these A's are calligraphic. I didn't mean to put in any calligraphic A's. These should all be Roman A's. Um, so out of <coughs> P, Q and T, you can form some very complicated looking two by two traceless matrices, which I uh, didn't want to write down here, um, but they satisfy um, certain equations. And what these express is the fact that as I move T, if I if I move this pun fourth puncher T, if I alter my um, matrices A1, A0, and AT according to this form, then um, the monodromy of uh, this connection on uh, the trivial rank two bundle over the projective line with coordinate Z doesn't change. So in other words, as I vary the complex structure of this sphere with four marked points, there's a sort of way of um, varying this connection along with it um, so that the monogamy doesn't change. And these things are exactly given by solutions to the Panlevé equations. This provides a different uh, a sort of a priori very different perspective to the previous Hamiltonian perspective. Um, so you can do the same for the remaining Panlevé equations, although the, this interpretation came a lot later, but you have to include um, connections with higher order poles. And then, so the sort of we then have to think about what really does the monodromy of a connection with a higher order pole mean, um, which should in, at least include um, some notion of Stokes data at the higher order poles. And similarly, to interpret the time of the Panlevé equation as the complex structure of something that kind of has to get encoded at some local data in the marked points. So just to give a sort of uh, an example for Panlevé 1. So here you have um, uh, if Q and P, are, so if uh, Q is a solution of Panlevé 1, P is its derivative, then this family of uh, flat connections on the projective line is uh, uh, isomonodromic in this sense. It has a single pole at infinity of order four. Um, and what what actually the monodromy for this is is uh, is is five Stokes matrices. So the monodromy beta, if you like, is uh, um, five upper and lower triangular matrices. And these remain constant as you vary. Uh, Q along the solution of Panlevé 1. Okay, so from this perspective, the sort of natural um, uh, object which parameterizes um, solutions to the Panlevé equations is, is a, a moduli space of local systems. So here for Panlevé 6, it's on the four punched sphere. This is a very sort of classical object, a character variety. So if I think about how to parameterize local systems in the four punched sphere, I just need to give uh, three, um, three matrices associated to the, say, the loops around 0, 1, and t. That determines the one around infinity because their product must be one. And then I want to consider them up to simultaneous conjugation by um, up to simultaneous conjugation. So what I get is this um, GIT quotient of SL2C, three copies of SL2C by SL2. 
and the, the natural functions on, on such a variety uh, are given by um, traces of holonomies around various loops on this four functioned sphere. Um, and it's a very classical fact that finitely many of them suffice to, to generate the coordinate ring of this character variety. So if I wish to, um, yeah, if I have some very complicated loop, then applying scaling relations, I can reduce, uh, I can understand the trace around a very complicated loop in terms of some more simple loops by the scaling relations. So I only really need finitely many. And then, so there's a sort of analogous story for uh, um, uh, these connections with higher order poles. So, so there you get a sort of wild character variety. So I listed one here just to show that it sort of looks rather similar. So if you if you think about Panlevé one, really all the, the monogamy data is is um, the data of five Stokes matrices around the singular singularity at infinity. Um, so we have to specify essentially five entries of the Stokes matrix. So this is P1 to the five. You have to delete. Well, it's not exactly the big diagonal. It's a sort of you have to delete a sort of set which says two consecutive, the entries in two consecutive Stokes matrices can't be the same. So that's part of the diagonal. And then you have to consider it up to overall conjugation. So this is an object of a very similar flavor to this. And there are similar um, canonical functions, which are analogs of these traces of holonomies. Indeed, if you were, uh, you might want to think of this P1 as a, uh, SL2 modulo, it's Borel, and then it looks a very similar thing. Okay, so, so the sort of nice thing about um, the Panlevé, the, um, these character varieties associated with the Panlevé equations is that they're actually all um, families of affine cubic surfaces, which is kind of a somewhat amazing uh, fact. So, um, and shows really that, uh, you know, the, the Panlevé equations merit to be studied sort of together. So, the fact that for Panlevé 6, you get um, a family of um, cubic surfaces means that as you go to these sort of uh, through this confluence procedure to get the remaining Panlevé equations, you might expect something similar there. Um, so I've written I've written them very schematically in this form. So you have they all look like in affine coordinates x y z is a a polynomial in degree at most two in x y and z with some coefficients. And the coefficients there as many of those as there are parameters of the corresponding Panlevé equation. Uh, so, <clears throat> so this is what you get for Panlevé six, which is the sort of mother example. This is a very, very, very well known um, um, family of cubic surfaces. Indeed, you know, it's. Uh, gives uh, an expression for the, the character variety of the four functioned sphere, which is merely SL2 to the three uh, modulo uh, quotiented by SL2. So that's a very classical object in invariant theory studied already in the 19th century. And you see this uh, cubic form. So X, Y, Z is a polynomial of degree at most two in X, Y, and Z. These are the, the coefficients. Um, 
So this is actually a very sort of economical presentation, right? It's merely as a hypersurface. So I only needed uh, seven traces of holonomies here. So the sort of what I'm viewing is the coordinate functions on the cubic surface, x, y, and z. They correspond to traces around loops, which separate the four punches into pairs. So there are three ways of separating four punches into two pairs. I call those the pants curves because it resembles a pair of pants decomposition for the, the sphere with four punches. So that's three of the required traces. And then uh, you can take merely the traces around the simple loops enclosing the four punches. They give rise to these coefficients. So, out of these seven traces, there's a unique relation between them. If you follow what the scheme relations tell you, this is what you get. Okay, so that's Panda Ray 6. Um, so, oh yes, so I guess from its very form, you can see that um, there's a compactification uh, a cubic surface to a, a projected cubic surface with a triangle of lines. So if I go back one second to the previous slide, um, if I were to homogenize this equation by putting in, say, T, I would find that I created three lines at infinity, namely x equals t equals zero, y equals t equals zero, z equals t equals zero. I'm sorry this being of order at most two tells me. So there's a sort of a very natural compactification. There's a sort of natural holomorphic symplectic form uh, on these cubic surfaces. So um, in fact, um, uh, you can write down the corresponding Poisson brackets just by looking at um, partial derivatives of the uh, this f of the previous slide, this f2 of the previous slide with respect to x, y, and z also has a natural geometric explanation from the character variety point of view. And this time it extends truly with simple poles to the boundary. So this is sort of what we would understand as a, a log Calabi of surface. So for panda a 6, I truly have a a four-dimensional family of log Calabi R surfaces parameterized by this A, B, C, and D. So uh, for various values of the parameters, it will have uh, so there will be some singular members of this uh, this family, but but for generic values of the parameters, uh, the cubic surface is smooth. That's kind of very six. Right, so um, so again, um, it's nice to consider uh, what happens in the uh, away from the boundary, as it were. So, so if I consider the Picard lattice of the cubic surface, that's uh, a lattice of type affine E six. But if I look at the orthogonal complement um, to uh, um, the classes of the three lines in this triangle at infinity, or what I find is a, a D4 sub lattice. So, so this is what controls the sort of cohomology of the interior. Um, and then, so there's those three lines at infinity, and then there's 24. So we all know there's 27 lines on the cubic surface, so there's now 24 left. Um, and these really do have a meaning from the, the point of view of the Pandavay equation, or if you like, from the point of view of, of the character variety. So if you look at the 24 lines in the interior, these represent what I've called partially reducible local systems. Uh, so these are ones for which uh, um, pairs of eigenvalues of traces of holonomies around the simple loops coincide. 
Um, so there's, if you like, there's a common eigenvector to two of the holonomies and then the simple functions. And these correspond to certain very special solutions of the, the Pandelay 6 equation. I think these were baptized as truncated by uh, Jean-Pierre Rami. Um, it's kind of borrowing some terminology from the Pandelay 1 case. But, but this is merely to say that um, also here, the, the geometry of these these cubic surfaces, which arise from this isomonodromy perspective, um, really reflect very well properties of the, the Pandave equations themselves. Right. So, uh, so you can do the same for for the remaining Pandave cases, um, but the sort of new phenomenon that comes up is that if you try to compactify <coughs> the um, the affine cubic surfaces, you again, because of the form of the equation, you compactify with a triangle of lines at infinity. Uh, but they um, these lines then meet some of them at least at singular points of the corresponding projected cubic surface. So we're no longer talking about the generic member of the family of cubic surfaces. You have a member which has this special triangle of lines, so this special tritangent plane for which um, the, uh, the three lines intersect at least some of them at singular points. So, so these are still sort of semi-stable cubic surfaces in the sort of GIT sense of the moduli space of cubic surfaces. So you can still realize them by blowing up the projective plane in, in six points, but they have to be in special position. You generate some minus two curves and you contract the minus two curves to, to leave these, these singularities, all of which occur um, in the intersection points of the triangle of lines. So I've given a sort of uh, diagram here of how this looks. So, so for panel of A6, we had this D4 lattice, which was the complement of the triangle of lines. And then as I progress further along this sort of confluence diagram, <clears throat> I need to look into the orthogonal complement of the minus two classes that I also contracted. So I get various sub lattices of the, the D4 lattice. I can do something for the degenerate panel of A3 cases as well, but given that they weren't nearly uh, lattices of thinking type, I, I left them off. Okay, so you have this sort of, um, uh, uh, yet again, another diagram um, sort of representing this sort of degeneration along the, the confluence of the Panda Bay equations. Right, so, so um, I guess we've now seen, <clears throat> I've introduced the sort of two perspectives that the Panda Bay equations provide. So you can, and out of them, you can construct two sort of different looking non-compact hypercalar manifold. So on the one side, we saw these uh, rational elliptic surfaces, or really the, the complement of a, a singular fiber in a rational elliptic surface. And on the other side, we've just seen through this isomonogamy perspective, um, the complement of a triangle of lines in a, in a cubic surface. So they really parameterize the same um, uh, the same thing, namely solutions of these Panave equations, but <clears throat> but they're not isomorphic as holomorphic symplectic manifolds. So both of them came with a sort of natural um, holomorphic symplectic form, but these do not agree. But uh, <clears throat> they do sort of work together in the sense that. Um, these two perspectives can be related by 
um, uh, can be found in a, a one-dimensional, a very special one-dimensional family of holomorphic symplectic manifolds, namely those parameterized by a, a twister sphere coming from a hyperkähler structure. So from the perspective of the Panlevé equations, that, uh, that one-dimensional family is really parameterized by that scaling parameter lambda, which we use to, to find the, the limit as the rational Olympic surface. So this is a, a very, uh, perhaps one of the simplest cases of a very more general phenomenon. So, um, which is um, a sort of non-abelian Hodge correspondence relating Higgs bundles and local systems. So these, the, these rational elliptic surfaces provide <clears throat> um, perhaps the smallest dimensional examples of moduli spaces of Higgs bundles. Um, the cubic surfaces, or really the complement of the divisor in the cubic surface, provide like the smallest dimensional examples of uh, local systems on Riemann surfaces. Um, <clears throat> so by work of uh, Hitchin, we know that um, these, in general, there is a hyperkähler manifold, which is given by some solutions to a partial differential partial differential equations called Hitchin's equations, such that on the one side, you can uh, see a moduli space of Higgs bundles, and on the other side, a moduli space of local systems. So this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, twister family um, is something that exists in, in much greater generality. And these are like the very simplest examples of something more general. Um, and the sort of <clears throat> uh, input that this perspective perhaps gives to mirror symmetry is that uh, in this rational elliptic surface, I have an elliptic vibration that if I uh, move along the twister sphere, so if I do a hyperkähler rotation, then the elliptic vibration gives me a vibration by special Lagrangian tori, which is the sort of input to the SYZ picture of mirror symmetry. This is again something that can be said in this much more general setting on moduli spaces of Higgs bundles. You have the Hitchin vibration, it's a vibration by abelian varieties, namely Jacobian of certain curves. Um, <clears throat> and by hyperkähler rotation, you can view that as a, a vibration by special Lagrangian tori on the corresponding moduli space of local systems. Tom? Okay. Yes. Sorry to disrupt you, but there's a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, I can't see the chat while I'm. So, is the lambda in the degeneration the same as in lambda connections? Yes. Yeah, so, the lambda is of lambda connections. I guess, really, perhaps I should complete this diagram a, a bit more. I didn't do it. But so, <clears throat> so recall that. Uh, the, the lambda that we saw in the, the context of Panlevé equations allowed us to take this limit from a, a general, uh, from a, a surface given by blowing up nine points in a rather general position to nine points in a special position. Um, so that surface given by blowing up nine points in a more general position uh, really represents a moduli space of flat connections, which sort of might complete this picture. So I could have put that maybe down here, <clears throat> and then that fits in the, this family uh, parameterized by lambda, by this lambda connection construction, so that when lambda goes to zero, I have a moduli space of Higgs bundles. <clears throat> and then this connection over here between flat connections and local systems is given by taking monogamy. So this is sort of what people term the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, holomorphic symplectic manifolds, it doesn't matter the moduli space of flat connections and the moduli space of local systems are the same as holomorphic symplectic manifolds. 
they of course um, uh, the map, this sort of monodromy map or holonomy map is very transcendental. So they don't share at all the same algebraic structure but as holomorphic symplectic manifolds so are the same. And then you can <coughs> view moving lambda here as this passage from here to, to Higgs bundles. So yeah, so that lambda from earlier, you should think of as a lambda in, in that sense. Okay, so <clears throat> so now you sort of have the, the input you would require for, for SY, this sort of SYZ picture of mirror symmetry. Um, and then uh, the sort of um, expectation would be that you could reconstruct the family of cubic surfaces from a sort of scattering diagram or something to do with um, something which you can draw in the, the base of this space of the elliptic vibration. So there's many ways to view that. I'm not going to give a precise definition of uh, scattering diagram, even though I'm going to draw some in a second. Um, but there should be <clears throat> uh, a way of reconstructing this one side, this local system side. So in this case, this is this family of cubic surfaces from um, Sort of data which comes from this uh, elliptic vibration. So just to put this in a sort of slightly broader context for a second, so, so if we <clears throat> think about rational elliptic surfaces and possible anti-canonical divisors, uh, in particular if you like fibers of um, elliptic vibrations, then uh, there's a sort of ADE like classification of those. So if you look at type A, then that corresponds to either a smooth uh, elliptic curve, which is an anti canonical divisor, or a cycle of rational curves. And then this is a sort of setting where quite a lot has been written about. Uh, mirror symmetry of this pair. Um, so in particular, uh, there's work that goes back to Oru, Olov, Katsarkov, and so on in the homological setting. Um, there's also a sort of uh, statement analogous to a sort of analogous to the, the mirror symmetry, the lattice polarized mirror symmetry for K3 surfaces is a sort of similar an analogous statement of that in this case from uh, Doran and Thompson. So this is a sort of setting where um, a lot has already been studied and the, the sort of uh, typical suggestion for a sort of mirror partner is to study a del Pezzo with a smooth anti-canonical device. So here um, we're sort of <clears throat> looking at the, the complement of that case. So um, if we, the, um, the divisors we saw the, that we deleted in this rational elliptic surface, those that came from Panelay equations uh, from the, the D and E, e series. Um, so this perspective is kind of suggesting that um, uh, a sort of natural thing to kind of regard as a, a mirror pair might be a, a particular a cubic surface, but of course potentially with singularities where a triangle of lines and infinities intersect. And instead of having a, a general del Pezzo surface and a smooth anti-canonical divisor, this perspective seems to lend itself more naturally to having um, a potentially singular cubic surface and uh, an anti-canonical divisor consisting of three lines which intersect in singularities. Okay, so um, so there's really you can really um, uh, identify uh, 
uh, the lattices on the two sides. So if I if I look at the orthogonal complement to the um, to this uh, fiber in the rational elliptic surface, um, then I uh, uh, inside the the Picard lattice of uh, a rational elliptic surface, then what I find is is this. So, so I find um, uh, for the Panové six case, this affine D4 lattice and as I go along, an affine A3 lattice and so on. And that looks suspiciously, suspiciously similar to the uh, diagram of lattices um, I gave for uh, the uh, orthogonal complement to the triangle of lines in the cubic surface. And indeed, if I look at a further orthogonal complement to the section of the vibration, then that deletes this uh, the, the affine vertex here, and I recover exactly the same lattices. So, so that's a good start. There's an identification of the two lattices, um, which sort of represent the, if you like, the cohomology of the, the interior. Um, uh, indeed, there's um, I think there's also some pretty recent work of Silad Sabo, which um, uh, identifies the sort of uh, de-affinized part of these things um, as either the sort of major part of the, uh, the weight filtration on the cohomology of the affine cubic surface, or the major part of the perverse filtration on the cohomology of the uh, the elliptic vibration and the sort of affine vertex corresponds to the, the sort of one dimensional part which represents either the boundary uh, uh, in the affine cubic surface or the, the fiber of the vibration. So sort of um, what you can do, um, so there's a sort of good identification of bits of the cohomology, which lend some credence to, uh, to this relationship. Um, and I would expect that um, we could also try and do like you would do for K3 surfaces and like has been done for, um, uh, for this sort of type A setting I mentioned on the last slide. There should be some way of relating um, lattice polarized um, examples of this. So in other words, that's to say is when you um, find particular singular fibers of these cubic surfaces that corresponds to um, particular degenerations of the um, uh, or particular singular fibers in the elliptic surface coming together, in the elliptic vibration coming together. Okay, so now I'm going to try and uh, jump gears a bit and try to say something about uh, um, this sort of reconstruction of the cubic surfaces via um, uh, from the data in this contained in the scattering diagram. So, so I uh, I put. On this slide, um, uh, certain quivers associated to the, the Pandavay equations. So yet another thing that's associated to the Pandavay equations. Um, we will see two ways in which these quivers are related uh, in the next two slides. Um, but uh, I don't know of any sort of more direct relationship, which to me feels a bit disappointing. So I know I have some uh, experts on Pandavay equations in the audience. Maybe you might like to tell me how these things are more directly related to the Pandavay equations. It's really a mutation equivalence class of quivers, and they all contain a sort of uh, dinking like diagram in their mutation equivalence class. So I've just reported that here. Um, of course, A3 and D3 and affine A3 and affine D3 are really the same thing, but 
this gives sort of two different realizations of some of the uh, some of the Panave equations here. And the sort of interesting thing to note is like the, the sort of ordinary linking diagrams correspond to the sort of rational Panlevé equations, the affine ones to the trigonometric ones, and this elliptic uh, linking diagram, which I've denoted to this double tilde, to, to the elliptic Panlevé equation, Panlevé 6. So it feels like there's something happening here. Um, but let me give you a couple of concrete relationships. So, so one goes via spaces of stability conditions of a certain Calabi out three category associated to the quiver. Um, so this is actually how I first uh, got into this whole story. In my, my thesis, I, I described certain, uh, the, the bases of these uh, elliptic vibrations that I've outlined in this talk uh, as spaces of stability conditions for these Calabi R3 categories associated to the quiver. And the way this goes is by integrating um, uh, a certain meromorphic one form along which whose exterior derivative is exactly the holomorphic symplectic form of the rational elliptic surface along certain one cycles in the fibers. So this is the sort of rough picture that you would get for, for Panda Ray 1. Um, you get a sort of central charge of uh, your simple objects of your category. It's associated to the A2 quiver in this case. Uh, there are only two simple objects by integrating this uh, differential, which looks suspiciously similar to what we seen before for Panda Ray 1 along uh, a basis of cycles in the elliptic curve. So this again forms part of a general story. So if I were to look at more general moduli spaces of Higgs bundles, um, you can observe that their bases, namely spaces of quadratic differentials, correspond to spaces of stability conditions for Calabi I3 categories of an associated quiver. And moreover, the sort of scattering diagram, which is produced in the base by the geometry of the, uh, the Hitchin integral system, really can be constructed just from the perspective of stability conditions. It's work of Tom Bridgman from a few years ago. So that's one perspective. Um, the sort of other perspective, which is related to the cubic surfaces, uh, goes via cluster varieties. So, so I can produce uh, the total spaces of um, these families of affine cubic surfaces uh, as the, the cluster X varieties, as a particular cluster variety of the corresponding quiver. And then from there, um, there's a sort of an iterative procedure to produce the scattering diagram. Um, so in both interpretations, there's a sort of natural, both, both ways in which I can interpret the quiver, there's a sort of natural way of interpreting the scattering diagram Q. So from the cluster perspective, what's interesting is the, you have sort of uh, toric charts. So um, this gives a way of writing natural functions on these cubic surfaces. So that there were these traces of holonomies in this character variety as Laurent polynom polynomials in something. Um, we tend to go label, go by the name of Fock Gonchorov coordinates after Fock and Gonchorov. Um, but these interestingly uh, themselves relate to the elliptic vibration. So a, one way of interpreting what Fock Gonchorov coordinates are is as holonomies of certain abelian local systems, C star local systems on the fibers of the elliptic vibration. Um, which uh, so you can sort of view this expression as the natural functions on the character varieties as a Laurent polynomial is writing it um, 
as some sort of sum of um, colonies of abelianized connections. Okay, so that, that's the two, two ways in which you can produce all of this, uh, the, the two sides of this picture from, from the quiver. Okay, so these scattering diagrams are in fact very simple. Um, I've given a sort of very schematic picture of some of them here. Um, so there's only three incoming, so if you were to try and produce them from the cluster variety point of view, there's only sort of three incoming rays, um, which have maybe two, one or zero simple singularities on them. Um, so I could view this, if you like, perhaps uh, all in one go by sort of pulling in uh, singularities from from the, the toric cubic surface, which has a pair of A2 singularities. So this scattering diagram over here gives you panel A6, and then this one on this end, panel A1. Okay. And then you can try and compare the... Uh, uh, the, uh, but then um, what this Grossiebert process spits out is it gives you three theta functions, which correspond to the three divisors in the cubic surface, which you can express as Laurent polynomials by counting broken lines. Um, so this you would want to compare with writing the coordinate functions in terms of Fock-Gonshaw coordinates. And there's another perspective on that, you could try and just compute products of these theta functions. You can do that by accounts of tropical curves and you should compare that to producing the cubic satisfied by these um, uh, holo traces of holonomies via, um, via the skein relations. So there's sort of two ways of comparing uh, this sort of the natural functions produced by mirror symmetry, namely these theta functions, with the sort of natural functions from uh, on these character biases, namely these traces of holonomies, and we can really check that they they coincide. Uh, so I'll flash up what happens for panda A6. So so very recently, uh, gross hacking keel. Uh, Ebert wrote this up in a paper which they called the mirror of the cubic surface. This is their expression that they, they get. These are these theta functions, theta x, theta y, theta z, corresponding to the divisors. And uh, you can, with appropriate identifications, you can, you can probably almost see by eye how this, uh, this compares to the, the fricker klein family. Um, and together with Helga Ruddat, um, in work in progress, we've done the, done the same thing for the remaining panel A surfaces. So you can really match up the natural coordinates coming from mirror symmetry with the natural coordinates from the, the character variety perspective. Okay, so uh, I think I am essentially out of time, so I will I drew two pictures to finish the talk with. So I will throw up this one of some sort of broken line computation you can do for panel of A6. Um, this is one Laurent polynomial expression you get for one of these three coordinate functions, which you can check, you can get from both the abelianization perspective and this this perspective by broken lines in mirror symmetry. And then to leave you with a picture which is slightly more familiar, I thought I would take us all the way down to panel of A1. This is perhaps a sort of um, uh, perspective on um, uh, a sort of new perspective on a familiar object. So, so this panel of A1, as I'm sure many of you have, well, as, as we've seen, right, is associated to the A2 cluster variety, which is this much studied, much, much studied object. Um, so these 
X, Y, and Z are actually uh, really uh, uh, three of the cluster variables of that. So you can do something from the five cluster variables, you can eliminate two of them, and the remaining three satisfy this, this cubic, which is you know, the cubic of panda ray one. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I will stop. I will flash at my side of some future directions. If any of those words sound like they're interesting, feel free to ask. And uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>